The Bloomberg NEF EV Outlook is kind of the Bible for global EV sales information. And for COP26, Bloomberg NEF produced a uh, fact book with some really eye-popping numbers in it and information about the uh, global EV industry. So I'm going to talk to Corey Cantor, who's a transport a transportation analyst about that. Welcome to the interview, Corey. Hey, Mark. I'm glad to be here. Well, one of the things that caught my attention was a comment in the, in the fact book about how forecasts for ZEV zero emission vehicles uh, have become way more bullish in the, in the last two years. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so each year, I, I think, as you kind of highlighted, we put out a long-term electric vehicle outlook. And so we're looking at not only where the sector is going over the next year or, or five years, which is uh, a more short-term view, but where we see it going by 2040. Um, and so our outlook has changed from year to year. For example, in 2019, we only looked at battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. In 2020, we introduced fuel cell vehicles. And in 2021, we adapted that forecast. Uh, other organizations do it too. So in the zero emission vehicle fact book, we included both OPEC uh, and IEA. Uh, there are other organizations that do it too. Sometimes ExxonMobil or BP will do it, uh, Deloitte, other organizations. But we really wanted to kind of go with those that have been doing it for a bit longer uh, compared to. And so what I'll say is on our BNF side, we hit about 677 million zero emission vehicles. That's just BEV and fuel cell up from about 495 in 2019. Yeah, I, I, I saw the, the, the numbers. Uh, here's another quote that uh, again, caught my eye. Forecasters now see tens of millions more zero emission vehicles on the road in the future than they expected in 2019. That, that increase in the in numbers, uh, I think, is, a, uh, is important. And what it suggests is that, you know, by 2023, we may see higher numbers yet, 2025, higher numbers yet. This is an industry that really seems to be disrupted and is changing quite rapidly. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of measuring that kind of S-curve inflection point that is challenging, I think, for all kind of outlooks. Um, and so even I'll say in the short term, you know, the EV sales that we expected in the U.S., for example, are going to be higher uh, than we published the report back in May. Um, it's challenging to kind of when something is growing exponentially to really get there and say this is exactly what it'll be or what it'll be nearby. But that's why we think it's good to be transparent and show over time how our forecasts have changed. And more importantly, if you look at the other organizations like IEA and OPEC, they have updated their forecasts as well, suggesting that everyone was you know, less bullish on it a couple of years. And even the oil majors that are directly, uh, you know, maybe have a disincentive or, or a challenge with uh, EVs also see the, the, the sector growing over time. Now, well, let's, you mentioned the, uh, the inflection point on the S-curve, and we're big fans here at Energy Media <laughs> of the S-curve. Uh, and the, I think the general consensus is that EVs have hit that inflection point. And if you look at uh, your numbers, uh, in the first half of 2021, uh, EVs made up 7% of global car sales. Yeah. And in some regions, like China is 11%, Europe is 17%. Uh, that's clearly well beyond the inflection point. Right. Uh, is that a fair comment? I think that's a fair comment for those regions. I think you've seen both on the kind of policy side in Europe and China, that kind of investment to kind of have electric vehicles take off, but also in terms of model availability uh, in both China and Europe, uh, which is a kind of difference from North America, what you're seeing. Um, even still, these numbers are pretty remarkable. A couple of years ago in Europe, for example, you were only seeing about 3% EV share of sales in the major markets like the UK and Germany. And now you're talking in the first half of this year, getting to 17% and the year is not even over yet. Things can change really quickly. Um, and we talk a lot at BNF about upfront price parity as being that kind of you know major ICE versus EV breaking point. Um, so it, it kind of highlights an upside case in many different markets that haven't hit the inflection point yet. Well, let's uh, talk about the industry itself. Uh, we've saw, we've seen it in the last oh, year or so, uh, significant commitments from automakers like yeah. GM and Ford and so on to convert to uh, electric. 
And your numbers are that clean transport investment will exceed $240 billion in 2021. And leading automakers are 45% more committed to EVs than they were in 2019. That looks like a wholesale changeover from, uh, from internal combustion engine to electric. Yeah, and can I tackle those two points separately? Because I'll, I'll tell you how we think about it, which I think is important. The first on investment numbers, you know, we at BNF look at both passenger vehicles, commercial EVs, electric buses, and then the charging infrastructure that goes along with that, as well as fuel cell vehicles and their charging. And so those are numbers that we, you know, already see in kind of the, the marketplace and really highlights that kind of 2.6% in 2019 to 7.2% first half of 2021 transformational change. When it comes to the automaker targets, those are forward looking, right? So even though GM or Ford might say, you know, 2035, these are our aims, they still have to make those investments and they have to put those models out there. So very forward looking. Um, either way that you slice it, I think it's a reason to say that things have changed, uh, both in the marketplace as it currently exists, um, but also what automakers are signaling and how they're thinking about it. You know, you have to kind of balance between saying things are changing a lot, but there's still a long way to go in terms of when you're hitting, you know, most of an automaker's revenues coming from EVs versus ICE. Now, uh, within the industry, uh, you know, getting back to the other curve, the adoption uh, tech, uh, tech adoption curve, we've seen innovators, we've seen early adopters, uh, and now early majority adopters within the industry. But there obviously are still some car companies that are a little reluctant to, to yeah. dive into the, the EV pool. They would be the late majority and laggards. When are we going to expect them to make the switch? Yeah, and I guess the, the way I'll, I'll talk about it, it's a little bit outside of kind of our zero emission vehicle report, but we put out this other report called uh, basically AVS, this automaker EV exposure scores. Um, there's some uh, automakers that maybe haven't even had a single BEV model out yet. Um, one that comes to mind, you know, is Subaru that's releasing the Solterra next year, um, kind of their full uh, battery electric. Not that they don't have a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle out there. Um, so b basically on kind of a top level, as we approach price parity, you would expect to see more automakers move um, because it's you know cheaper and more affordable to put an EV out there. But there is risk too, right? There's only so many EVs or so many vehicles sold each year. Um, if you're too much of a laggard from the automaker perspective, you know maybe a new uh, entrant like a Rivian or a Lucid or obviously Tesla, I'd say, is more of a, a market leader. You know can take more of that market share. And unlike maybe phones or, or other products where you want one every year. For every other year, people get cars eight to you know, 12, 15 years, depending on your market. Um, so there is a you know, potential losing scenario if you wait too long and this is a product that people really want. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can see if you're a company like Subaru or Honda, uh, maybe even Nissan, you know, like they brought out the Leaf, but they haven't electrified the rest of their, their uh, model. Yeah. So they're, they're taking a bit, a bit of a gamble. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about price parity because I interview your colleague, James Frith, who's the, the head of battery storage or uh, yeah, battery storage uh, all the time. And uh, the numbers are really startling. I mean, we're, you know, an average of $137 a kilowatt hour uh, in 2021. But by the end of the decade, I mean, it's, it could be as, you know, under $60, maybe $50, $50 a kilowatt hour. And at that point, where do we reach price parity in there? Yeah, so the number we always like to refer to at BNF is about that $100 per kilowatt hour amount. Um, we put out a report, usually in July or August. I worked on that as well, using a lot of James's data. And I could say for, we don't do Canada per se, but for the U.S. comparable market, you know, we really see segment-wise uh, 2023 and 2024, depending on if you're kind of a SUV or large vehicle, it'll come first just because the battery comprises, you know, less of the premium overall portion of the car. Smaller vehicles, because batteries make up a bigger proportion of the overall price, it takes a little bit longer to get there, especially because those smaller vehicles are cheaper to produce in the ICE, you know, fashion. What I will say is it's important to take in context of any uh, conversation around upfront price parity, these supply chain uh, challenges, and not just the semiconductor related aspect, but if there are battery related uh, mineral kind of supply side shocks. When I did the most recent report, we threw in some sensitivity analysis around potentially really high um, spikes of overall battery costs. 
and it does delay upfront price parity by anything between six months to two years, depending on how aggressive you want to sensitivity test it. That being said, you know, assuming kind of the expected curve from uh, James's previous report in the end of 2020, we would expect it to be 2023, 2024. And last thing I'll say on that is, you know, plugging James's uh, numbers uh, for the battery price survey that comes out literally in a couple of weeks, usually December of every single year. And I, I think, you know, I won't spoil the, the kind of surprise of it, but definitely something folks want to keep an eye out for. Okay, well, uh, I, I'll just flag that in my calendar because <laughs> I am very interested in that. Look, you, the, the, there's a section in this new, uh, in the fact book about market drivers. And I think this is really critical because policy has driven sales or certainly helped uh, develop the industry for a long time. But you're talking now about policies evolving from subsidies to more market-based mechanisms. Yeah. Can you explain what that means, please? Yeah, so traditionally, or I think the first way that the country would think about uh, improving the appeal of an EV is from that customer demand side. So I'm just going to say, hypothetically, if you have a Model 3 and it is $48,000, here's a $7,500 tax credit. Now the Model 3 is $41,000. A consumer is more likely to pay for that um, than a more expensive car. But that becomes expensive for governments to do over time. So what you've seen in a lot of countries, US, for example, uh, is fuel economy standards where you're not giving a carrot to an automaker, you're giving a stick and saying, if you don't meet these kind of uh, fuel economy targets, and many countries do that, but they weren't based around thinking around EVs. It was more so around uh, your normal kind of fuel efficiency improvements. In Europe, they have this program called the CO2 uh, emissions program. Uh, similar way of thinking to your fuel economy, but instead of a mile per gallon, you wanna get to about zero grams of uh, CO2 per kil uh, kilometer. And so what that means is even PHEVs, right, uh, will give off some type of uh, CO2, given that they have to charge or given that they have some smaller tank. So you see a shift away over time from those subsidies, which are really quite generous in a lot of markets, not just the US and Canada, but in Europe, you know, in Germany, you get about 9,000 euros for a uh, battery electric vehicle at kind of the maximum, maximum price. Um, we don't think it's coming next year, but you know, mid-decade and a lot of subsidy programs you're seeing, those are kind of the target dates. That can always change depending on uh, government will, um, but ultimately there's gonna be so many EVs on the road that they're gonna go from saying, okay, here's the, the carrot for the consumer to automakers, you, know, you have to basically make the transition. Um, and in some ways we talk about in the report, you know, all towards they may be end of the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles. <laughs> We were talking about batteries a minute ago, and, and yeah. uh, there are a couple of other facets to that conversation. One is uh, new battery electric vehicles can charge faster than the than the older ones, and the range is going up. The range is yeah. an average of 400 kilometers in 2021. Uh, we're seeing lots, plenty of them that are in uh, 500 kilometers. Uh, and I guess we, we ex given that the energy density is going up an average of 7% a year, that's an astonishing figure, I might say, because that means that by the end of the, at the end of this uh, decade, we're going to have very, very high, a much higher uh, range than we do now. Yeah. So are those, those annual improvements uh, going to be a big driver of, of, of EV sales? So it's an interesting question and interesting way to phrase it. I guess, you know, and given that this is a team uh, of a, a few of us who worked on the report, I don't want to speak for kind of my colleagues' conclusion on it, but what I will say when we're talking about range in general, and this is what's come up in kind of previous BMF events, you know, we might be approaching a world where you're going to be seeing different offerings, maybe like you're already seeing in terms of the long range EV, um, your kind of base EV, but maybe your base EV as opposed to it being 200 uh, miles will be a 300 mile base and then the 500 extender. Because at some point, if you have fast enough chargers, you're not going to need to go bigger and bigger with your battery range. Um, and if anything, that's going to continue to keep kind of the overall cost of the EV high. If you have kind of a world where you have faster charging, smaller batteries, that's less material use, you know, you'll begin to see uh, even more of that kind of upfront cost reduction. So a long way of saying, uh, I think the range will continue to go up. But the way that automakers might think about range might vary, especially as chargers get faster and more prevalent. There is kind of kind of an optimum you know, range that you would really want um, without kind of keeping prices at the same level, uh, at, at a quite high level. If you go for 600, 700 kilometers, 800 kilometers, beyond what a consumer really needs for most drives. Uh, Corey, uh, final question. Uh, one of the 
impediments to adoption so far uh, has been the lack of models. And yeah. we're just seeing uh, manufacturers begin to roll out some new models. Now, what, are we, what should we expect over the next few years in that uh, department? Yeah, and, and I think it goes back to an earlier comment that I made. And, and in a way, I like to think about it too is, you know, model announcements are kind of a forward thinking uh, aspect of, you know, if GM says they're going to release 20 uh, or so by 2025, that's something that they can put their foot in the ground and say way in advance or investments in, we're gonna put X amount of billions of dollars in R&D. Um, the sales are the last piece. You know, the sales of the ID3 and the ID4 by Volkswagen is years and years of work and investment. So I think it's a good sign that we're seeing more models uh, by both those who kind of have a bigger EV portfolio, uh, whether it's a kind of GM and Ford uh, or those like Subaru that are kind of getting their feet wet. Um, the more models you see, the more sales are going to go up. So I think we can expect to see that across all of the regions. I think the question becomes, you know, not only how many models there are, but how well are automakers going to uh, produce them, right? And will you avoid that kind of supply side constraint? Um, so I think on both questions, you're going to see uh, an increase. The question is how much, um, which has a big impact on how, how large the industry uh, continues to grow. But I will say the, the F-150 Lightning is going to be a pretty interesting one to watch in terms of newer segments coming online, right? Not just your kind of uh, sedans, but you're getting now more into the pickup truck space with Rivian just beginning to ramp up. Um, so we've been talking about that for a bit over the next year, watching those models come to, uh, to the scene as well. Well, this is an exciting space to watch, I have to say, uh, and has all, all sorts of implications for industry and energy consumption and so on. So Corey, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Yeah, really appreciate your time, Markham.